Hello, everybody. This is Jacob Jans with the Writer's Workshop at Authors Publish. Today, I'm pleased to present Michael Mangiello of Inkwell Management. He's going to give a lecture on um, passion, professionalized, how to build an authentic and thriving writing career. His talk will have two major components. First, um, the agent's perspective, and also, great, and also he'll cover greater reader awareness and being an authentic member of the literary community. So Michael is an agent for Inkwell Management, where he's been for, I think, over five years. Inkwell is one of the top literary agencies in North America. Um, they represent many best-selling authors across a variety of genres. Michael specifically is interested in literary and experimental fiction, counterintuitive social science, and self-aware histories. He's also um, actually the agent for one of our instructors at the Writer's Workshop at Authors Published, Dice K. Shen. So, um, Michael, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome. How are you? Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. I am doing well. I'm very excited to speak with you guys about this. It's my favorite topic. So. That's great. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. So we may as well jump into it. Great. Perfect. I'll just start by uh, sharing the screen so we can get to the slide. And let's see. Okay. I think it's, it's work. Um, great. Okay. want to start by saying thank you all for giving me the honor of uh, delivering this lecture. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am, and I'm especially excited to answer any questions you guys might have um, after the lecture itself. Uh, as Jacob said, with any luck, this lecture should accomplish two things which are rather important to me. On one hand, I'd like to provide you all with a kind of look behind the curtain, um, revealing what goes on in the publishing world, as well as what I've seen looking out from my perspective as an agent. So, you know, you'll see hopefully not only the world in which I'm lucky enough to work, but also you'll get a chance to see what an agent looks for in an author. And we'll also talk a little bit about what you guys as authors would look for in an agent and eventually what you'd look for in a publisher. Uh, and as I do these two things, there's something else I'd kind of like to do, which is kind of just um, doff my cap. If I can use that old timey phrase, I'd like to doff my cap to the independent literary world. Um, Jacob and I were talking about this a little bit before the lecture, and it's just such a great thing to see the independent literary world thriving. Um, I really got my start in it and um, close to it today, and it's just essential to the literary landscape. Um, and so we'll be talking a little bit about how important your guys' relationships are with each other and communicate basically how the big five publishers and the world of large agencies couldn't survive without the world of independent publishing. So with those intentions out of the way, kind of wanted to start with the most basic questions possible, starting you know, around having a passionate relationship to writing. So the first question of course would be, why write? And of course the answer to that is because it's fun, sometimes very fun. Why is writing fun? Because it's meaningful. And why is writing meaningful? because of readers. As we'll see, an awareness of readers is going to be the essential thing that allows you to take your passion for writing and turn it into a sustainable career and profession, which will allow you to go on writing and making your relationship to your craft uh, even more satisfying. So before we talk about readers, I'd like to talk a little bit about writer and the kind of two meanings that writer has. On one hand, the term is kind of vocational. A writer is someone who's most self-realized when writing, when lending either playful or serious form to their imagined or actual experiences. And on the other hand, a writer has a professional meaning too. A writer is someone who publishes, someone who even at times sells their work. While Samuel Johnson's remark that nobody but a blockhead ever wrote except for money is kind of funny as far as aphorisms go, I wouldn't take it too seriously. Um, it's not entirely true. And to prove that, 
here's another aphorism by the Austrian writer Karl Kraus, who once said that an aphorism can never be the whole truth. It's either half truth or a truth and a half, which I think is even funnier than the Samuel Johnson aphorism. This is all to say, I don't think it makes you a blockhead if you're writing not for money, because every piece you write is another step forward toward becoming a better writer who has a closer relationship to your craft and a deeper understanding of your audience. That's what you're writing for when you're writing. And in my opinion, that makes you the opposite of a blockhead. In other words, and as we'll explore in just a moment, what makes you a professional writer isn't the amount of money your pieces bring in or the number of journals in which you publish. Instead, what makes you a professional writer is the attitude you hold towards your writing. If you're professional about your writing and serious about getting a sense of your audience and what they're getting from your work, then you're a professional writer. I don't imagine anyone decides to become a writer with the intent of using literature as a means to achieve fame and fortune. Uh, nobody sells out by becoming a writer. But the aim of a writing career is to keep writing, to structure your life and resources in such a way that you're able to spend most of your energies on your writing. So a professional attitude towards your work and your readers leading to a career ensures the stability that makes it possible for you to continue on in your vocation, unencumbered by the distractions of making ends meet. In other words, the dream here is that the professionalization will serve your passion. As I said earlier, it all comes back to readers. And we'll talk about your relationship with the readers in your life in classes, writing workshops in just a moment. But I figured in terms of peeling back the curtain, it might be helpful to start by explaining who my readers are uh, and kind of outlining who the big five publishers are, some of who the independent publishers are, and the editors and publishers who will be reading your work once you or your agent submits to them. So we'll start with the first of the big five publishers, which is HarperCollins or Harper. Uh, you'll see here, there's quite a few names. Each of these names represents an imprint. Basically what an imprint means is it's a semi-autonomous collection of editors who are able to bid on a book. You can only submit to one editor per imprint. So for instance, if there are five editors at Harper, I can only send to one. That said, if I think a book might be right for either Harper or Echo, I can send to one editor at Harper and one editor at Echo, thus making for two submissions under the HarperCollins imprint. Basically, this means if you're an agent for a writer, you have opportunities within a publisher for multiple submissions, but you can only pick one editor per imprint. Uh, I've also, for the purposes of anyone watching, kind of highlighted in all of these slides, the imprints that I would consider uh, those most likely to go for kind of more independent writing, experimental literary work. Here I've isolated Echo, which was run for a very long time by a man by the name of D Dan Halper, uh, who was a poet himself and found the writer Anthony Bourdain and published him for a very long time. The next big house would be Hachette. Uh, they're known for their flagship imprint, Little Brown, which I'd say also kind of publishes the stronger literary fiction uh, among these. Um, funny thing here is that one of these imprints, 12, is famous for publishing only 12 books a year, uh, one book a month, as it were. The third of the big five is Holtspring. And here we'll find maybe the most uh, famous literary house, which is Far Strauss and Giroux. Um, they, I think, still have more Nobel Prize winners than any other publisher uh, and are kind of vociferously committed to quality. Um, they're one of kind of the few houses where, you know, editorial acquisitions aren't overly informed by what the sales team thinks the book will be able to deliver. So they have a great deal of freedom. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend the book Hot House, which is kind of a history of Forrest Strauss and Giroux. Uh, especially good publishers of poetry. Fourth of the big five, Simon & Schuster. Uh, I'd say their literary imprint here is Scribner, um, famous for publishing uh, Dana Spiota for a long time, Don DeLillo, and Jesmyn Ward, of course. Finally, the last of the big five and the largest, uh, Penguin Random House. 
you'll see here that they have a little bit you know, of a wider selection of imprints being the bigger of the big five. And for those interested in kind of experimental or literary work, I particularly recommend Knopf, Pantheon, Vintage, and Riverhead. Now, these big five kind of constitute what people think of when they think of quote unquote, New York publishing. But I wanna share with you guys that in point of fact, independent publishing is as important for an agent as these big five publishers. And it's as thriving a community. Um, in point of fact, it's often independent publishers that a writer will have the opportunity to really experiment and have a chance to refine their voice, uh, as well as, I think, expand their audience and reach all kinds of people that traditional publishing sometimes can't reach. So these are just, of course, this is sampling of the independent presses that we go to. Uh, Catapult, Counterpoint, Soft Skull are wonderfully adept at publishing experimental fiction and fiction uh, for marginal voices. Archipelago Press is uh, fantastically committed to literature and translation. They only do translated works. And um, as an agent, it makes me very happy that there's a space for that in the publishing world. Grey Wolf, Milkweed Editions, New Directions, and New York Review of Books, also fantastic. Um, New Directions and New York Review of Books, especially for what they'll do to bring out of print books back into circulation. And this will be kind of the last slide. I know it's been a lot of names, but the two publishers here who I'd outline would be Small Beer Press, which is run by uh, Kelly Link, the writer of wonderfully exciting and experimental kind of sci-fi fantasy stories. And then Tin House, which is, um, of course, sort of legendary uh, Northwestern press, um, which has done a lot of great work to show that publishing does, in fact, exist outside of New York and great publishing, in fact, exists outside of New York. Those were a lot of names. There are a lot of names for me too, and I see that list every day. So one thing I would recommend if any of you guys kind of want to do a deeper dive um, into some of these houses and what they publish and whether your work might be right there is a Publishers Marketplace. Um, it's a resource that is, you know, it's just publishersmarketplace.com. And if you have a membership there, what you're able to do is look up not just imprints, but also specific editors, specific agents, and specific authors. See where their books sold, for which rights, more or less for, for what amount of advance. And you can kind of use this resource to inform your decision about who you'd like to work with and where you think your work would prosper. Um, membership fee is $25 a month. Unfortunately, I do not have a promo code. Otherwise, I would share it with you. And they're not sponsoring this, but uh, I'm very lucky because I work at an agency where, you know, it's a sort of business expense and we have access to that. But I did want to share it because it is kind of um, more or less uh, democratic. And you guys, if you have a membership here, would have, you know, basically the same Rolodex that uh, all the New York agencies do have. Okay, now. Hopefully we will be done talking about me for a very long time now, because what I'd really like to talk about is you guys. Uh, and specifically, having just gone through who my readers are, I'd like to talk a little bit about your readers. I think the, the, the story um, that we hear about kind of writers making it and turning their passions into professions, it's as a few steps. I think the first step is you find your people. First, you find the people that you trust, people that you share stories with, that you're in communication with, um, people whose work excites you, and people who push you to become a better writer, um, and people who push you to become a better reader, too. So that's kind of the first step. You'd go from there, hopefully, to taking some of those workshop stories or poems or essays, submitting them to journals or magazines, and get some rejections, but get some acceptances too. And you get some publications out there which have come out of your work in the workshop. A literary agent or editor reads one of those essays or stories in long reads or Hobart or you know, wherever it may be. And they reach out to you and you begin working with an agent. And from there, the agent takes a manuscript that you both have worked on editorially, sends it to a publisher and you get a publisher. 
So I think that's kind of the arc, right? Is that you kind of start with the people around you immediately and it translate at some point into a book. I guess the question is that maybe we should talk about first is how do you select the people for that first step? Like, how do you know when you found your people and how do you go about finding them? I imagine this is kind of a particularly pressing question uh, given that we're still sort of halfway in the pandemic. Um, and I think a lot of things are still a bit remote. But here are some kind of general guidelines that might be helpful and have at least been how I and some of my clients have found some of our people. First and foremost, uh, attending readings is a great way to find your people and the people who will become your readers. Um, it's great on one hand because you'll get to see the material that people are reading and how they're presenting it. And you'll get a sense for what's going on in the literary world at the moment. And also hopefully more for in-person activity than over Zoom, you have a chance to sit down next to someone you don't know or grab a drink next to someone you don't know and talk about the reading and hopefully hit it off and meet people who are interested in the same sorts of things as you. Otherwise, I'd recommend you know, essentially what you guys are doing now and what I know Authors Publish promotes, which is you know, enrolling in classes, workshops, working with instructors, um, instructors who provide invaluable expertise and encouragement. I kind of like to think about these classes and workshops, not just in terms of the instructor, but also in terms of your classmates and your peers who are there with you. In a certain sense, you'll forgive the metaphor. Uh, I kind of see in a workshop, the instructor as the diving board and your classmates are the water you then swim in. You know, the instructor kind of helps you take the first jump into exploring this new area of writing. What you really take with you from the class are the people that you took it with. Some of my best friends and later clients are people who I had catapult class workshops with back in 2015. And we kind of just kept in touch and kept sharing work together. Um, so I can't stress how valuable those classes and workshops are. Uh, and I hope you guys will continue pursuing that if it's through chat or maybe just a drink. Uh, hopefully with a pandemic in the rear view mirror not too long from now. Another thing I'd recommend is just reaching out with an email about work that you enjoy. Um, I know of several literary friendships which kind of began out of the blue with a DM or an email after someone had read a story or a book and was just moved to reach out to the author. Uh, I also don't think I know an author who wouldn't mind a note saying that they'd done a good job. So I think that's a kind of a good way to go and also, it's a very authentic way of connecting. You know, it's not, doesn't have the, um, you know, feel of counterfeit to it. You know, I mean, when you really love a book, an author will be able to tell and they'll have all kinds of ways of showing their gratitude for, to you for that. I'd also kind of recommend, outside of those more personal interactions, I'd recommend kind of looking at where your favorite authors publish and reading new works in those publications by authors with whom you're unfamiliar. Uh, one of the best resources that people don't often tap into is the back of the book, um, oftentimes in a collection, sometimes even in novels. If you go back to the acknowledgments, um, the author will kind of name check not just their agent and editor, which is very valuable, but also the places that originally published some of their stories. These places could range from Grant and the New Yorker to you know, The Nervous Breakdown or Joyland or something like that. And so it pre presents a very wide spectrum there for you to sort of explore on your own. Something I did, which um, you know, might be a bit analog now, I think, is when, when I was first beginning, uh, I got the most recent copy of Best American Short Stories and I flipped to the back of that book. And what they do in the back of that book is they lay out a list of every single journal that they read to select the stories that they did. And this thing is like, 15 pages long, it's a very small print. Um, and what I did was I just got a composition notebook and copied out the uh, magazines in there, which serves as a kind of atlas for you. And if you know, I had maybe a bit too much free time back then, uh, if you don't have the time to do it or the inclination, I know that's a lot, but it's a very good resource. And alternatives would be kind of, you know, obviously Authors Publish provides a wonderful resource in terms of which journals are taking submissions and which contests are going on. 
I know Entropy Magazine also does work like this. So there are much less uh, analog resources available to those of you who don't want to write out a full composition notebook uh, worth of literary journals. Um, but I, I'd really seriously recommend just tapping into these um, larger reservoirs of, of, of information, just so you know which journals are out there. And once you start kind of learning the names, you'll start recognizing which authors publish where, and you'll get a sense of kind of the different literary wavelengths that are out there and which are right for you. I'd also really, really recommend getting involved on the ground level. You know, I mean, everything up until this point has kind of been looking in from the outside and seeing what's going on and which journals are publishing which writers. But the next step, I think, is to find a journal that you really like, that you feel aligned with, and see if you could work there, maybe as a reader or an editor, so that you can help shape the conversation that's going on. Um, this is also essential because, of course, the more you read of other people's work, the better a writer of your own work you'll become. Uh, you get more familiar with what works and what doesn't, a reader's degree of patience, and you'll just be kind of a more empathic writer yourself. Finally, I'd say that where there's smoke, there's fire, by which I mean, if you do all these things, you'll end up interacting with a lot of people some of which will be friendly, but some of which will be more than that. Some of which you'll see are, are really friends of yours. And I think that in these environments, when you meet someone who you feel you really click with, that's worth pursuing. Um, a literary friendship basically means a collegial relationship is possible because one of the key things you might wanna look for in a peer as you begin assembling your writers groups is someone who is able to be both candid and someone who takes care with their critique of your work. So you're looking for honesty as well as kind of, kind of an earnest helpfulness. Uh, this is also another list, and you know, feel free to screenshot this, but um, this is a list that uh, an agent I was very lucky to work just a few feet across from when I first started in publishing uh, gave me. Um, she just represented some of my favorite writers, still does. And I asked her, you know, well, what should I be reading to, to find writers like that? You know, I mean, where are people still doing this? And she sent this list back in 2016. And over the years, I've added a couple names to it myself. So this is kind of a composite, but um, I think it would be good if, you know, you either on your own or after consulting someone who's kind of in the same literary world as yourself, who's maybe been around for a few years more than you, kind of built a list, list like this yourself, a sort of literary speed dial of places to, to check out. Now, on kind of a more personal level, I'd say, you know, this, this gap that exists between having writing as your passion and wanting it as your profession, um, it, it seems kind of, formidable and you might wonder kind of how to bridge the gap. And I think the answer, which we've kind of been alluding to in the previous slides is by making personal connections. I think the number one discouragement that writers face is kind of seeing the literary world as a conspiracy that's out to get them or kind of inhabited by faceless gatekeepers. But in point of fact, it's run by specific people with interests and values, just like you who, you know, uh, also, you know, don't have so much free time and they have other jobs and they're doing this and they have families and personal lives, but their enthusiasm for writing is so great that they make the time. And I think that's kind of a good way of seeing it so that, you know, you're less prone to the feelings of discouragement that can come when submitting to 30 places and not having heard back for three months or something like that, uh, which sometimes happens. Um, I'd also say that at heart, wanting to be a writer is more than anything else a desire to participate in an ongoing conversation. And in order to join a conversation, the first thing you have to do is listen, of course, so you can contribute meaningfully and have fun as you do so. And in the world of writing, that means the first thing you have to do is read. So I'd say generally the way to look at it is that with each publication, there comes a connection. Whether or not you get paid for the publication or whether or not the publication is in a journal that's this size or that size. With every workshop meeting, 
editorial session, and publication, you're taking another step forward. Step outward toward your growing community and network of writers, as well as a step inward toward your own deeper and more informed relationship to your own craft. As you kind of construct these communities, one thing to also keep in mind is a kind of literary diversity in the sense that you're looking for someone who understands what you're trying to do, but you're also looking for someone who's not just a version of you from kind of an alternate reality. You know, you're not looking for a writing workshop composed of clones. What you'd like to do is find literary friends who see what you're aiming for, but also people who come from distinct literary backgrounds of their own, backgrounds which maybe could illuminate or complement what you're doing. In other words, if you're in a workshop and you are working on literary fiction, it might help to have someone in there who loves literary fiction, but themselves is wanting to write young adult fiction, or someone who kind of loves poetry, but is trying to write an essay. More than anything, the environment of a writing workshop and these kinds of communities that emerge out of lectures and classes, what those things should encourage is a sort of literary cross-pollination. And I think, I think more than anything else, the thing to look for here is authentic friendship, uh, because that is as valuable as it is rare. And of course, friends serve you best because they do have your best interest at heart. So that would be kind of what I'd recommend in terms of what to look for in you know, people with whom you share your work and whom you trust. This next slide is kind of about what to look out for. And I've kind of constructed a composite personality here of someone that I'll name Bob. Uh, for the purposes of our thought experiment here, Bob is someone who uh, was told early on that he was a genius, uh, believed it, and then stopped reading all contemporary writers, period, and kind of shutting himself off from the voices of his contemporaries. He doesn't want to be influenced by other people. He wants to go to a cabin somewhere and just uh, send out his stories. And if they're not accepted, it means that he's a genius and the world is wrong and the world is kind of against him. And I think we've all at certain moments in our lives interacted with kind of people like that, people who don't seem to really want to engage with the writing process and the rewriting process. And, you know, to look out for some of these things as you construct your own writing community, I've kind of outlined some of the things to, to look out for. Basically, you know, you wouldn't want to work with someone who narrows their vision of the literary landscape, falls into the trap of short-sightedness, neglecting to see the wider world of publications around them. Someone who says, for example, I don't read online literary magazines. Um, essentially, you know, you wouldn't want to work with a, a non-reader. You also wouldn't want to work with someone who's a non-rewriter, someone who basically is more enamored with the thought of being a writer and attaining celebrity than with the work that's actually entailed in terms of writing to provide pleasure for readers rather than just writing to receive accolades for themselves. And finally, you really wanna look for people who believe in literary community as much as you do. And of course, everyone wants respect and recognition. And those things come from publication, but those things come from publication and you're able to publish only because of your authentic engagement with literary community. You know, I mean, literary magazines can very easily tell the difference between someone who kind of believes they're a lone genius and you know, a journal is lucky to publish them from people who have actually been reading the journal and who care about the writers there and who kind of just want to join the conversation. Um, and so I, I would recommend avoiding the bobs out there, uh, which I know we all are, and, and also kind of just thinking about uh, the importance of kind of authentic community building as you proceed in your uh, writing career. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about just how, how lucky I've been to, to work with some of the writers that uh, I've worked with. Um, I wanna say first that small magazines and indie publishers are what made me wanna work in publishing in the first place. Um, and you know, I, there are places I can name, uh, some of which I had earlier, but um, 
more than anything, I was drawn to the fact that there was something new happening and the conversation I wanted to join. And that's still what informs my work all the time. Uh, I still read small magazines. Um, I still read kind of um, these kind of micro press published books because I know that there are these powerful voices there that haven't been heard through more kind of traditional routes. And that's the thing that always excites me and, and keeps me working. Um, and I'd just like to say kind of two, two stories here. One of which is a few years ago, I read a story on Hobart that I loved. And I saw that the author was giving a reading later that night. And it was in New York. Um, I was downtown and the reading was on the Upper West Side, but I made my way up there after work, um, saw the reading, it was great. And afterwards, everyone was kind of just walking around. And the writer came up to me and asked what brought me there. And I'm very glad he did that because I wouldn't have had the nerve to start a conversation with him. I was happy he talked to me. And I, I told him, what brought me here was your story. Um, I read it and I loved it. And, and yeah, I just wanted to see you read. And he heard me say this and he didn't say anything back. He just turned around and walked away, which made me think that I, I blew it, of course. But what he did was he came back with a signed copy of his small press book and he gave it to me his free of charge. And he said, thank you. you know? And then, uh, th I mean, that meant the world to me. And then later on that night, we got drinks and later on that month, we got drinks again and so on and so forth. A few years go by and we're friends. And he comes to me one day with a novel and um, asks if I'd be willing to represent it. And I am honored by that, by the trust that that showed and excited by the opportunity too, because I'd kind of seen his career for a few years and had become a fan of his. We were lucky enough to uh, secure a publication deal with a literary imprint of one of the big five publishers. And what I love about this writer is um, still close friends. His day job is uh, working heavy construction. And the time he found to write was the most hard one time possible in between shifts, on the way there, on the way home. And he still has that work ethic. And um, I'm particularly excited because this weekend I'm going to be reading a draft of uh, his new novel. And you know that's just one example. I have another story, another client of mine, um, also a friend. He wrote a beautiful novel. I loved it. We sent it out over the course of a year, had 30 submissions, all of them rejection. It was pass after pass. But what the author did during this time was exactly what he had always been doing, waking up at 4.30 in the morning, uh, which I myself couldn't do and is impressive on its own, but waking up at 4.30 in the morning, writing for an hour. And as he was writing and receiving these rejections on his last novel, he was kind of paying attention to what the editors were saying and tracing a through line from it all. And he used that feedback and incorporated it into his new novel, which happily, we were able to sell to a literary imprint of a big five publisher five days after we began submitting it. So from a year with projections to five days, it kind of just goes to show what perseverance and also an openness to feedback can do for a writer. And kind of returning to those few original questions of, you know, why write? Because it's fun. Why is it fun? Because it's meaningful. And it's meaningful because of readers. These writers were able to persevere and the writing was able to remain meaningful to them because they were always thinking about their readers. They were always thinking about their readers' reactions and they were always thinking about how they could write to better communicate with their audience. And because of that, they were able to kind of build a career from something that for them had been an organizing passion. It is a great privilege of mine to work with people like this, and they inspire me to come at my work with the same attitude they display in theirs. And I know that you will all recognize this attitude as well because it's something you see within each other, within your writing groups, your literary journals, and the community that authors publish fosters. So from an agent's perspective, that's what I'd say I see from my vantage point, kind of looking out at the world. Those are the qualities that in my experience 
allow writers to turn their passions into sustainable and growing professions. And I hope part of the preceding section goes some way to doffing my cap to the independent literary community. Uh, it really is a world where authors have the essential opportunity to forge bonds and learn from each other and take advantage of the twin gifts of freedom and accountability within their workshops to experiment and hone their voices. The independent literary scene can't be said enough. Uh, it's where I got my start. And I continue to believe that the literary world of independent publishing is the stone from which springs the fountain of all of our industries present and future talent. So to pull a little bit back of the curtain, some of you might be wondering kind of what comes next. You know, I have my writing group, I have my friends, I've begun building my career. Um, what happens? You know, what do I look for in an agent when someone contacts me? Well, what you'd be looking for in an agent is essentially what you'd be looking for in a member of your writing workshop. In effect, your agent should be your best reader. And when you start talking to an agent, the things to keep in mind are, do they understand what I'm going for? Do they understand what the novel looks like in your head or what the manuscript looks like in your head? And secondly, can they articulate the gap between what's in your head and what's on the page? And can they help you bridge that gap? The third question would be, do they have a conversant relationship with your influences and background? Do they know who's important to you? And do they know kind of the stories that you'd like to tell? And you know, do you get a sense from them that that lineage is, is valid to them, you know, and that they're gonna work to protect that relationship between you and the people whose stories you're telling? And finally, are they willing to engage in conversation? And to kind of elaborate on that point a little bit, as I said, your agent should be like the best member of your writing group. They should be able to articulate more clearly than anyone else what it is that you do better than anyone else. And they should be able to tell you where your text falls out of alignment with your vision. And as with your favorite workshop member, you may not always agree with the specifics of your agent's feedback or critique, but there shouldn't be a moment's doubt that your agent has your best interests at heart, that their only goal is to make your manuscript as much itself as possible. That's who your agent is editorially. And the first stage of your work with an agent will be editorial. They'll be refining your manuscript and getting it to a point where it's as polished as possible before they can present it to publishers. Once you guys have done that, and once you have that editorial relationship firmed up, then the submission process begins. And this is what it would, this is what the process would be for the agent at that point, working alongside you, of course. First thing the agent would do is kind of craft a pitch letter, which is a bit like the query letter that you yourselves might craft for an agent, but this time it's from the agent to the publisher. And essentially it's the agent putting in their own words what makes your manuscript so unique. The next thing your agent will do is kind of diligently select the right crop of editors from a variety of imprints, some from the big five, some from the independents. But in all cases, editors who your agent feels would respond to your manuscript with enthusiastic insight. Essentially, it's like looking for the next member of your writing group. Um, and then the third thing would be to generate interest among these publishers to kind of choose people from different imprints and set things up where there might be a few different people interested from a few different imprints and a few different houses and use that situation as a means of generating from these publishers the most competitive offer possible. What will then happen once a few editors are interested and say, I'd like to acquire this novel is your agent will arrange for you to speak with each of these publishers and editors. And the question is, well, what should you do in that conversation? What should you ask? What, what are they looking for you to answer? The publisher, for their part, they're looking for a partner, not just an author, by which I mean a publisher is looking for someone who is dedicated to making writing their real career, their real life. Someone who can take feedback, someone who's thinking about the next book, someone who is enthusiastic about the work and someone who's going to help 
promote the book after publication, whether that's doing readings or a book tour or interviews, someone who sees themselves as a partner to the publisher. And for your part, you wanna be looking for a partner as well, which means someone who is kind of going to take you seriously as a writer and someone who is serious, not just about their financial commitment to your work in the form of the advance or the royalties, but someone who really wants to ensure that your book gets the attention it deserves. And so a few of the questions that kind of get asked at this stage are, what season will the publisher release the book in? Will it be a lead title? Where and how would they promote it and market it? Where would they try to publish excerpts of it before publication? And of course, there's the financial question of the advance. Um, luckily, your agent will kind of handle some of those more awkward conversations for you. So you don't have to kind of talk about money and marketing plans and rights and stuff like that. Uh, so your relationship with the editor can kind of stay aligned. The most important thing for you in terms of talking to a publisher and making sure you have a partner is that they get where you're coming from. You know, to a certain extent, you're gonna be looking in a publisher uh, for the same things that you were looking for in an agent. Someone who understands what you wanna do and can help you get there. And in fact, in certain auction situations, I've seen this happen a few times, the author doesn't always choose the publisher who offers the highest advance. In fact, rather often, they choose the publisher they feel understands their work most deeply and the publisher who most gets what they're trying to do. At this point, with this context, having spoken to publishers and seeing their offers, you would make your decision about who you wanted to work with. Once you've chosen a publisher and you're working with the editor, the relationship with your agent kind of um, shifts slightly. Of course, your agent remains there and present and supportive, but at this point, you're relationship with the editor and the publisher takes priority in terms of how the manuscript is shaped and, and worked on. So the editor at this point becomes your main point of contact and your main reader. So what's the agent doing? The agent is there, of course, to provide a read at whatever stage you'd like, but he's also there to solicit blurbs uh, and share with maybe authors whom his colleagues represent. Um, which is one of the good things of working at kind of a collaborative agency as Inkwell is, there's a lot of cross-pollination that happens there. And a lot of times, you know, we'll be able to kind of help each other and link the different authors we represent so they can help promote each other. Your agent will also be able to submit excerpts of your book to magazines and journals so that you can kind of publish uh, smaller pieces of the large work to generate interest. Your agent will amplify your profile to help securing attention for the publication, which can mean sharing a latest publication or news of the deal or the cover reveal of your book on the agency Twitter. Or it can mean getting an assignment to write an article for a newspaper or something like that. Anything to kind of raise your name visibility ahead of the publication of your book. And finally, the agent stays involved with the ancillary rights to the book. Ancillary rights basically mean any rights that the publisher didn't get. For example, if the agent sold the hardcover and paperback and ebook rights to your book to a publisher, that means they retain the audiobook, translation, and film and TV adaptation, which means that as there you know, is more excitement for your book to publish in the States, your agent would then share with a German co agent or an Italian co agent or a French co agent and say, this would be great as a book in Germany or Italy or France. And they would also share with Hollywood agents saying, this would be a great book for you know, uh, a documentary. This would be a great book for a TV series. Basically, they continue pitching your work to make sure that your story has as many lives as possible and to make sure that you're kind of getting as many opportunities as possible to share your work. And I think that brings me to the end of this lecture. Um, my personal involvement after lecture will be to answer your questions. Uh, I wanna thank you guys again for your time and attention and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the independent literary world and how it fits into publishing. Thank you, Michael. That was uh, really enlightening. And I learned a lot actually. Um, 
one of the so if you have questions and you're watching this live you can type them into the chat and i will pass as many on as i can to michael um one of one of the things i i thought was really interesting is a lot of what you're talking about it seems to me that when you're choosing to represent someone it's not just their book but like the person themselves right when when authors learn to submit to get publication so much focus is on um what it is they're submitting but how do you think about that in terms of just representing the author versus the the thing they're trying to get published sure yeah i i i i think it's absolutely the case that an agent is looking um to represent the author because i think part of it is that you know you'd really want to find an agent who's as passionate about the work as you are which means that they don't see it as kind of a one-off thing but as the beginning of um a career and kind of a a, a, a working life together mm -hmm. um and i i think that's totally the case too i mean i i imagine a lot of authors sometimes and I, I think i've even spoken with authors about this is a lot of times i think authors can feel a bit um nervous that like if their book doesn't sell their agent would drop them you know or like there's like so much pressure on like this one thing yeah but but really the investment should be in the author themselves because what you're embarking on is um a partnership more than anything else that hopefully goes on for many books. Um, we got a, a question before the lecture that I think is related to this um, from someone who's had an agent for a few years and they haven't sold a book and doesn't seem to be working out. Like, do you have any advice for that sort of situation? Sure, yeah, no, I mean, um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes that, that happens. Um, I, I think the best place to start always is having a conversation uh, with the agent in question mm -hmm. and kind of saying, you know, what's going on here and can we fix it? Um, and, you know, that could mean maybe trying out a different style or trying out a different medium. For instance, I'm not sure if the person asked the question works in a particular genre versus another, but if you're working in short stories, maybe to try a novel, if you're work working in poetry, maybe trying nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, sometimes it's not a match and, you know, there may have to be a parting of terms, which is sad, but yeah. I, I'd always say that if possible, um, you know, you should just try to have kind of a, a candid conversation uh, about it with the agent in question um, so that they could, you know, see if they can fix it maybe um, either by submitting to different people or maybe kind of framing the project differently. Okay. That makes sense. Um, so do editors or agents show up to online events and work or workshops or readings to like check out potential authors? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think, yeah, I, I, I think that certainly happens. What's funny is, um, a lot of agents and, and authors I know also do creative work themselves and they're kind of, you know, at least my, my favorite, you know, colleagues are always learning and always trying to kind of learn more from the writers around them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'd say uh, maybe that, that it's not scouting per se, but yeah. I would say that like there will be uh, editors and agents around you at classrooms, mm -hmm. lectures, and readings who are enjoying the same things you're enjoying and because of that might enjoy your work as well. And is that maybe because they're just part of the community as well. 100%, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, yeah, it, it really is a thing where we're really all just readers, mm -hmm. um, just trying to make our enthusiasms uh, contagious. It seems to me that being an agent is actually a really hard job. So you're gonna, like agents in general have that passion for the work they do as their primary motivators. So of course it follows that they would be involved in the community because that's just where their interests are. Yeah, it's, that's very nice of you to say that it's, it's a hard thing, uh, but it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good heart, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just like one of those things. I mean, so, something I still like to do is, um, yeah, kind of um, review and, and check out galleys of forthcoming books, like Full Stop um, is a really good review 
website. And, um, you know, it's something that I find really rewarding is just like keeping a look at what's happening uh, among smaller presses, because more often than not, it's kind of a predictor for stuff that's going to hit the rest of the reading world in like a year or two. Do you look at like micro presses and small presses in terms of finding people to potentially publish or represent? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And that's true for journals as well as books. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's just like those, I mean, some of those places I listed in the presentation and, um, you know, and, and some of those houses in the independent publisher slides, um, there's really no other environment that will really just allow writers to experiment um, mm -hmm. and kind of just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks, like independent publishing. And it's just the most vitalizing thing. So I, I definitely continue to read those to look for potential new clients. Um, what about, it? say, when, you, when you're publishing in literary journals, it's usually shorter pieces like essays or short stories. Um, is it a hard path to try to turn those into a book to get published and represented by an agent? Or is it better to um, tr try to get a, a, a full length manuscript, like an actual novel represented? Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really good question. I think, I think it really depends. Um, not just on your work, but also the kind of agent too. Like, mm -hmm. I, I know some agents who are kind of drawn more towards um, plots and kind of like longer stories. And for them, something like a full manuscript might make more sense. Uh, for me, I'm kind of driven by voice first and foremost, mm -hmm. which is why sometimes like, even though it's shorter, pieces published in literary journals, um, that are kind of short, they can still demonstrate a mastery of voice and the fact that there's kind of a unique voice there. So for me, a short piece is enough, but even if you were submitting a longer manuscript, um, the fact of having been published in certain places acts as a sort of bona fide for the agent that you're someone who can participate in the literary community. That makes sense. It and it seems to me your perspective is you're really looking for people that are making their lives as a writer in one way or another and are dedicated for the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Just people who remain kind of, um, who can put uh, that enthusiasm into practice and who, who enjoy doing that. Um, uh, another question, just sort of from a whole different topic. Uh, I think this is a question a lot of people have is what is a ballpark figure that agents charge to represent an author? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a really good question. And, you know, I, I think kind of the answer varies, but mm -hmm. more or less the, the, the thing is, um, is that, you know, agents really don't, you know, charge, um, they work on commission. Mm -hmm. So the thing is like the agent won't get money until you make money, you know? So they'll take whatever 15% or something, right? Like, but they won't charge you until you get payment from the publisher. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of something to keep in mind. And part of why it is such a partnership and it's like, until the money comes in, they're like working on spec as much as you are. So it's kind of a alignment there. Um, is there typically at some point a contract between an agent and an author? Yep. And absolutely. Yeah. And is that, does that happen usually when the agent says, I want to represent you and the author says, yes, I agree to that. And then you negotiate the terms. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then included in that, you'll decide like what the commission would be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That kind of stuff would be, yeah, kind of worked out there and yeah. what the commission is and, you know, um, yeah, any exemptions that you want to carve out. Sometimes academic writers like to carve out exemptions for you know academic papers and kind of just want okay. to represent their trade books. But that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I know I know someone writing a book and they're just really coming from the academic side of things and is and they wouldn't be publishing in literary journals. Um, would a lot of the things you talked about sort of be translated to like their academic publishing? in terms of demonstrating like participation in community? Sure, yeah, no, I, I think that would make sense. 
um, I, I also uh, count among some of my clients, um, some really great professors who are kind of working from that context too. I think one thing to look for in particular for people writing from more of an academic place is um, their ability to translate expertise into a narrative that lay readers can understand. So mm -hmm. if I was working with a professor, obviously their academic papers would be really useful, but you know, it'd also be nice to see if they were, tra were um, translating some of that into a piece for say the Chronicle of Higher Education or for okay. you know, the Atlantic or something kind of just, the academic publications are good, but even within that academic space, I think there are a few journals and venues that are good places to demonstrate um, crossover appeal. Mm. And you want to see evidence that they can demonstrate that crossover appeal in the future? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, you know, some of that happens just with time, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes the, the book sells first and then they're able to get into, you know, foreign affairs or Chronicle of Higher Education or something. But, um, but I think that ability to write for a general audience is, is um, uh, pretty, pretty essential. Um, earlier you talked about how much authors appreciate notes from writers. I remember um, my wife once read a poem she really loved published in the New Yorker, one of the biggest, like the most famous places you can get a poem published, right? And she wrote the author and the author wrote back and they had only gotten a note from one other person. So like people, um, you really can connect with authors in my experience it's not actually that hard um totally yeah, yeah no it's i mean it's like um you know i that, that's kind of the thing too that hopefully um i'm glad you said that and i'm, I'm happy your wife wrote that um author it's yeah. you know it's, it's one of those things where it's like poets are people too you know mm -hmm. writers are people too and hopefully some of the lecture kind of goes to show that you know publishers are people too and kind of um yeah. accessible yeah, I think I think people get cynical about the publishing industry sometimes, maybe because it's so competitive. Mm -hmm. But my experience is that it's full of people who are passionate and care about it and not at all in it for the money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, totally. And and I think when you kind of look under the hood, it's it's a lot more collaborative than it is mm -hmm. competitive. And you know, I think it's yeah. just kind of a lot of people trying to learn from each other. Yeah, and that word collaborative, I think that was one of the major themes of your talk today. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but um, if anyone has any more questions for me at Authors Publish, you can send an email to support at authorspublish.com. Um, Michael, is there any last few words you wanna say to the audience? Oh, um, I uh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I just want to say thanks. I mean, you know, I, I said in the lecture, but um, the independent literary world is really important to me. And I, I just feel like you guys could not be in a better place than with authors publish and kind of connecting with each other like this. So I want to thank you, Jacob, for having me and just thank everyone for listening. Yeah, thank you um, for the kind words. Um, as many of you know, Authors Publish sends out um, publishing opportunities and small presses like every week all the time. So if you're a subscriber you, or not, you can sign up for free at authorspublish.com and we'll give you lots of opportunities to participate in the indie press and the small literary journal community. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today um, and we appreciate you. And thank you very much, Michael, for the very, very thoughtful and enlightening lecture.